Good morning, class. So in today's botany six, or you can say the analytical technique in plant sciences, we are going to start the topic of flow cytometry. We are going to study about the flow cytometry principle and their application. So before going towards the flow cytometry, I would like to recall you the previous technique we have been completed about the microscope. Like we already studied about the light microscope and compound microscope, confocal microscopy, fluorescence microscopy. So basically, now this uh, flow cytometry, which we are going to study now, this is a combination of all the techniques you have studied earlier. So the light and the fluorescence and the confocal, all these kind of microscopic techniques which we have been studied, they are combinedly going to come in the sense of flow cytometry. So let's begin with the flow cytometry with the principles and application. This is a diagram or you can say the scattered in which our aims and objective will be going to see with how this scattering position and how this laser beams by the specimen can going to give us an exact sharp image of each and every particle present in a suspension of cells. So let's start with the introduction and overview part. So what is flow cytometry? So this word, the main, if you wanted to see the what is the meaning of flow cytometry, so the name suggests that it is a technique for cell counting and measurement of different property of cell. Like the cyto is equal to the cell and metry is for the measurement. So basically cytometry derived for the word meaning of the cytological analysis. So any measurement of a cell, any kind of like the shape, their size, their complexity, so if we wanted to know any shape, size and complexity of a particular kind of cell, then we have to go with the phenomena of flow cytometry. So this technique actually in which we have to find a special or individual kind of the cell from a suspension or you can say the combination of a cell mixture. Like for the example, if we have a complex structure, of different kind of cells together. Or you can say we have a suspension or we will have a, a mixture of different kind of cells. Now what we have to do, we wanted to isolate or we wanted to identify each and every kind of the cell which is present inside the suspension or you can say the mixture. So that at that time, when we wanted to identify a specific kind of cell their size, their shape, their component analysis, then we go with the flow cytometry or we have to use the flow cytometry for that purpose. So basically it's a laser based technology that measures and analyzes different physical, chemical property of the cells and particles. So this as a light, like in the light microscope, in the compound microscope, the thing which we have to use for the light purpose because everything need a light to make an image. So that's in this case we are going to use a laser. So you know the properties of laser, laser is very sharp and they are determined to provide a very sticky and sharp images so that's why we have to use the laser. And uh, this laser by the purpose, what is the purpose of using laser inside the flow cytometry? That they are going to analyze the different physical and chemical properties of cells and particles. So for whole their physical and chemical analysis, we are going to use a laser. This is our equipment in which we can perform the flow cytometry, or you can say the performance which uh, use a flow cytometry phenomena, that equipment known as a flow cytometer. This is a place where you have to inject your sample and this is a one manual work you can do in this whole technique that you have to uh, prepare the sample and after preparing that sample you just need it to be put it inside this instrument. 
when you firstly put down your uh, uh, sample inside this machine, after that the whole work will be done by the machine only. Then after you don't just to have to analyze the data that will be shown on the computer screen attached with this equipment. If we talk about the historical perspective, like how this flow cytometry come in position in today's world, like what are the phenomena which work in a background of flow cytometry? So in this, or for knowing the phenomena of flow cytometry, we have to go through with the historical perspectives. Like the very first here, in the very earlier, or you can say the beginning of the microscopic world, the 17th century, when the first time Leonard Hogg developed the light microscope. In the history of, you can say, the microbiology or microscope, both the simultaneously, they are having a speed up process after which by the Leonard Hogg developed the light microscope. So, as a light microscope, we needed a light for every image formation. That's why we take this. After this, 1879, principle of droplet forming by Lord Rayleigh. So Rayleigh given the process or principle of the droplet formation. So basically, when we see uh, he work on the surface tension and make a droplet phenomena for us to be known. So in that perspective, we are going to analyze at every each in single cell by the droplet formation. Counting of RBCs by Moldovan by forcing a suspension of cells through capillary tube. After the 1879 discovery, in the 1934, this uh, scientist Moldovan, what he found it, he, he counted the RBC. And for counting the RBC, what the phenomena he was used, he used the capillary tube action by the suspension cell. From the suspension of the cells, he used a capillary tube to identify the cell one by one. And this is a major kind of thing which we are going to use in the flow cytometry. Optical counting, then uh, in 1953, uh, but in between 1953 and 34, there was uh, another discovery was a uh, counter, or you can say uh, a little development uh, from the RBCs of the Moldovan in 1947 to 1949. The development of the Coulter principle by Vulcan Coulter and counting of RBCs using the first Coulter counter. So this Coulter counter, as in today in our lab also, we use the colony counter to analyze the colonies of any microorganism which we have grown on the uh, petri dishes. So any culture or anything, any microbial activity, we can analyze them by the colony counter. So in this case, uh, the RBCs has to be counted by this culture counter. So this analyzation technique is also useful to grow the flow cytometry techniques. After this, optical counting of RBCs by cross lens Taylor by use of laminar flow this laminar flow principle this is also very important when something is flowing when they are in movement they will be easy to isolate when someone uh, something it at rest position their accumulation is high they present very closely because there is no movement so they cannot be moved forward from one of each other so that's why if you wanted to move the things out or if we wanted them to be in a moving position or we wanted to isolate them so the movement is necessary. So that's why this laminar flow principle work on the movement of cells or movement of RBCs. After that, in 1965, there were two discoveries. One, the application of Sweet's principle and culture principle to develop the first cell sorted by an follower. So the very first cell sorter that was developed by the major M followers, uh, M follower because they were the first to identify the RBCs in a very accurate manner. Development of electrostatic inject droplet reflection by Richard Sweet. Now, after the same in the year 1965, Richard Sweet, what he did, he do the electrostatic inject of the droplet for their deflection property. 
This phenomena, we also use this phenomena in the flow cytometry. After just absorption or deflection of uh, from the specimen by the laser light, then a deflection, a deflection cause that has to be go under a voltage change. So this voltage change or electrostatic uh, ejection phenomena hole that was come from this Richard Sweet's development. After this development of fluorescence wave cell order by Wolfgang Gohadi, so that was also very important in the case of the flow cytometry because if you wanted to see a special cell organelles present inside the cell, then we have to need it to be them to identify by different dyes. So basically, this fluorescence they work on the dye portion, and uh, when we dye them with several different kind of fluorophore. So when they give, uh, when they excite it by laser light, they are going to give us a different kind of colorful analyzation on the desktop. After that, in 1970s, or you can say just uh, four to five decades before, we got our technique flow cytometry, or you can also say they facts. They are flow uh, cytometry activated cells. So this whole phenomena or whole principle of working of flow cytometry that is a combination of culture principle, principle of laminar flow, electrostatic, optics and light scattering. So this whole thing together will going to do the process of flow cytometry. Now we will see going to see the component analysis of the flow cytometer. So what kind of component are present inside our flow cytometer? Very initially, there are the three main systems which work under the flow cytometer. Fluidix, optics and electronics. So these three things going to combine the major part of the flow cytometer. What is fluid? So if we talk about the fluidix, sorry, fluidix system, they are transport particle in a stream to the laser beam for interrogation. So they are the suspension or you can say they are the liquid medium which are going to transport the particles inside the laser beam so that they can be interrogated. Because when the laser light is going to pass through each and one particle, then only they can analyze them by interrogating. So for interrogation, the thing which is responsible for that is fluidix. After this, the optics. This is a system consists of lasers to illuminate the particles in the sample stream and optical filters to direct the resulting light signal to the appropriate detectors. So the very first work that has to be done by laser light, they have needed to be passed through the sample and when the laser light passes through the sample, they have to be diffracted. So now, this diffracted light should be captured by something. So these uh, some things are the detectors which are going to make an image by having or by absorbing the diffraction light by the specimen. So these whole thing, the laser light uh, source or you can say the detector which are going to absorb all the things, they will become under the optics department. Now the last one, the electronics. These are the system convert the detecting light signal into the electronic signals. Now till the optics, they're just going to absorb the signal. And now in the electronic, they are going to make them or convert them into the formation of image. So the whatever the signal but that was going to be collected by the detector. They were going to be processed by the computer attached to the unit. And after processing, we are going to have the sorting images. So the electronic system is also capable of initiating sorting decisions to charge and deflect particles. So they can also do the Q work, this whole electronic work. They can also sort the decisions to charge and deflect the particles. Working of a flow cytometer, now how we already see the component analysis or what are the major components of the flow cytometer. Now we have to see the working of flow cytometer. How a flow cytometer works. In the flow cytometer, 
particles are carried to the laser intercept in a few distance. Okay, the flow centimeter particles they have to be carried to the laser intercept in a fluid stream. So what we are going to make first, we are going to make a fluid stream. Any suspended particle or cell from 0.2 to 150 micrometer in size is suitable for analysis. So now what can be the size 0.2 to 150 micrometer? So they can just analyze the particle size of the micrometer 0.2. They cannot analyze in the particle size nanometer. For nanometrical particle analysis, we have to go through for the electron transmission. The portion of the fluid stream where particles are located is called the sample cone. So where we are uh, going to inject a sample. And after injection of the sample, the place where they are going to be stored that place will be called as sample code. When particle pass through the laser intercept, they scatter laser light. So it's very obvious. Whenever a light have to be passed through any specimen in the microscopy technique, they are going to scatter the light, or they are going to diffract it, the light, or they're going to re uh, reflect the light. So the whole phenomena come under the scattering of the light. So they scatter laser light. Any fluorescent molecule present on the particle fluorescence. So basically, if we dye our specimen with the fluorophore, or you can say with the fluorescent dye, then when light is going to pass with them, they are going to be excited. The scattered and fluorescent light is collected by appropriately positioned lenses. After, there will be two types of light that are going to be scattered. One, that was a specimen scattered light. Second, that was a fluorescence light. So both the light, they are going to scatter from that specimen and they needed to be collected. So they have to be positioned first uh, for before the collection point, they have to be positioned by the lenses. A combination of the beams, splitter and filter steers the scattered and fluorescent light to the appropriate detector. So now this combination of beam splitter, filter steers, scatters, fluorescent, they all are going to found their appropriate detectors. So this founding the detector is very important because all the process now after the scattering, this will going to be depend on our detector. The detectors produce electronic signal proportional to the optical signal striking them. Now, when the, these optical signals are going to have on the detectors, what they are going to do? They are going to produce the electronic signals by the optical signal. So basically, these are proportional. Like uh, amount of the optical signal which is coming to the detector, the same amount of the electronic signals going to be performed by the detector. So by this electronic uh, signal process, we are going to have the image on next. Now we see the application part of the flow cytometry. So this flow cytometry is a sine qua non, means without which nothing. Basically, of the modern research to toolbox, if we see the modern research is um, if we in doing the research in the era of biotechnology, microbiology, or cell biology, biochemistry, botany, zoology. So this flow cytometry because everything, every living thing, they are made up of the cells, and analyzing the cell is our fundamental. Work. You can say that if researcher is going to do that, the very important thing to know the, about the cell, which is which they are going to work on. So that's why we calling them the sine qua non. Means without will, we cannot do anything in a research or toolbox. Flow cytometry measures multiple characteristics of individual particles flowing in a single file in a stream of fluid. So we know that the flow cytometry can measure multiple characteristics of an individual particle. So what their application, the very first and important uh, application that they are just not assuming only one individual particle or the one individual, sorry, 
or the one individual characteristic of a specific particle. Even they can measure the multiple characteristic of a one individual particle, which is have to be going to or which is flowing in a single file of a streaming of fluid. Now the light is scattering at different angles can distinguish differences in size and internal complexity. So what happened when the size when the uh, light is scattered? So the one light is scattered in the forward direction and other light is scattered in the sideways direction. So basically when we are talking about the forward light is scattering, so the forward light is scattering is going to make the size of the cell. And the all over scattering of the light from the specimen and that was going to detect by the detector, they are going to know the shape of the particle and also the complexity of the particle. So here, by this a single technique, we are going to able to find a specific kind of cell, their size, their shape, and their complexity too. So whereas light emitted from fluorescently labeled antibodies can identify a white area of cell surface and cytoplasmic energy. Now, as we also use the fluorescence inside them, so we can be going to have the data about the cytoplasmic antigens too and the cell surfaces. Like the cell surfaces have uh, a lot of things, a lot of proteins like lipids and other things. So that these, all the things can be measured by the flow cytometry fluorescence detection. This approach makes flow cytometry a powerful tool for detailed analysis of complex population in a short period of time. So basically, by having this all miraculous things, we are going to analyze several complex uh, things inside a population. So that's why this is, uh, can be called as a very powerful technique. Now, if we see the application one by one, like what kind of uh, diverse application we can find by the flow cytometry. Very first here, immunophenotyping. So immunophenotyping, they are the cell subsets are measured by labeling population specific proteins with a fluorescent tags on the cell surface in the clinical labs immunophenotyping is useful in diagnosis hematological meaningless such as lymphomes and lymphoma so basically in an immunophenotyping so immunology is based on the medical microbiology immunity Okay, so anything like what kind of cell proportion is present inside a human or an animal or a plant body, it can be analyzed like how many cells they are healthy or some cells they can be diseased. So basically the proportion of the disease and healthy cell that can also be analyzed by our flow cytometry. Cell sorting, so that's a very uh, fundamental feature of the flow cytometry that they can be sort the cell on the basis of their physical and also their chemical interest. Like the cell sorter is a specialized flow cytometer with the ability of physically isolate cell of interest in the separate collection tube and the sorter used sophisticated electronics and fluidics to identify and kick the cells of interest out of the Critic stream into a test tube. So basically, when we are going to get our cells of interest in from a suspension or from a complex or from a mixture, then we can easily isolate them uh, from the suspension. DNA content analysis, as we are having using the fluorescence inside them. So fluorescence or use of fluorescence is majorly connected with the identification of genetic material inside the cell. So that's why we can also analyze the DNA content by having the cyto flow cytometry. Cell cycle analysis as the flow cytometry can analyze the cellular complexity. So they also analyze what kind of cell cycle is going in a particular state of the cell. Like at the cell synthesis, S phase, division phase, mature phase. So what phase or what cycle or going through the cells or sometimes if you want you to see any problem inside the cell and that can be caused by the cell cycle the cell cycle analysis 
that also can be done by the uh, flow cytometry. Apoptosis. There are the two distinct type of the cell death. Apoptosis and necrosis. So these kind of the cell death has been seen in the cells. So can be distinguished by the flow cytometry on the basis of difference in morphological, biochemical, and molecular changes occurring in the dying cell. So if you wanted to know that how the cell has been dead or what are the cause which led to the cell death. So by analyzing their morphological feature, their biochemical activity, their molecular changes, we will be sorting it out like what was the cause of the cell. Okay. So this was also can be done by the flow cytometry. Cell proliferation assay. So in which we have to uh, know the cell membrane, fluorescent dye, carboxylofluorescent, succinyl ester, whether the cell are activated, they began to proliferate and undergo mitosis. So basically this cell proliferation assay that is all about the cell division process like uh, what kind of chromosomes binding take place, chromosome numbers, how they are going to be divided into their daughter cells, what is the configuration. So all these characters can be analyzed by the flow cytometry. Now a term called facts. They are the fluorescence activated cells sorting. Considered a group of the lymphocytes form a mouse that have been stained with clean fluorescent antibody specific for CD4 or you can say the fluorescence isothiocyanate or FITC, NDCD4 and red fluorescence antibodies specific for CD8 or you can say that the phyoserythrin or PE and CD8. So basically, we are what we are doing here. We are activating a cell by the fluorescence activity. So if a cell is activated with the fluorescent activity, and we can going to be analyze them by the flow cytometry, these cells are has to be called by the facts or fluorescence activated cell sorting. So both the label cell generate SSC and FSC. Are they passed through the laser? Beam counting voltage pulse that are recorded by the computer. So basically this uh, technique that uh, depend on the which cell can going to pass the detection process and making the image formation and which cell is not. So on the basis of their labeling, we are going to get that thing. Like which make it or which make it not. So basically, if a cell that uh, activated by the fluorescence, or we are having, we have to sort them on the basis of fluorescence activity. That has to be called a fluorescence activated cell. Each labeled cell will also emit light of a specific wavelength as a result of fluorescent label. So now, every fluoroform they have to emit the light of a specific wavelength. So when they are going to be exposed with the light, they are going to scatter something. They are going to emit it the light. For instance, CD4, this is a whole example thing. Okay. For instance, CD4 cells will emit green fluorescence light of wavelength 525 to 530 nanometer. While CD8 cell emit orange light of the wavelength 560 nanometer. So these fluorescent signal pass through the photomultiplier tubes and generate voltage pulse. Now we know a combination of the cell which have the specific wavelength of their emission of fluorescence light. So on the basis of these emissions, they are going to the make image or for the image formation, they needed to be passed through the photomultiplier. So by passing through the photomultiplier tube, they are going to generate the voltage pulses. And this voltage pulses that has to be generated by this fluorescence light, they are to be responsible for the formation of specific colored images by these light. So the software here integrates all the information for a particular cell along characterization of individual cell. So the software we have here is going to analyze all the information, gathered information, 
with him and now they will be going to convert them to individual cells you can see the phenomena here like uh, the laser that has to be passes flow cells flowing the cells and this laser will going to pass through the cell they are the focusing lenses and they are going to be add on with the detector this is a mirror which they are going to reflect these wavelengths and they are going to the specific detectors where they got to be voltage charge and after the voltage charge they are going to be in the formation of image formation now we will going to see the clinical applications so what are the clinical application of our flow cytometry this is a little, a little detail i am just going to read it out but the clinical application if in short i have to tell you that like we can study the cell in the flow cytometry so all the disease or you can say any uh, disturbance inside a human body or an animal body or in a plant body that basically start up with the very fundamental and most uh, small unit of our body that is cell so any problem if we wanted to see what is the core of that problems we needed to be go through with the cell analysis so that's why the for the cell analysis we have to go through the flow cytometry so in this case or in this way the flow cytometry is very useful in the clinical applications and dna content analysis in the dna content analysis if the disease have a cause by the genetic disorder like some sometime problem can be cytolytic sometime problem can be genetic cytological problem can be solved but genetic problem are hard to analyze so that's why the both the thing the cytological problem of a disease or a genetic problem of a disease both the things can be uh, you can say both the things can be investigated by the flow cytometry method investigators are currently using technique of dna flow cytometry to measure ploidy status like the dna content and proliferative potential as phase fraction in a wide variety of solid tumors so in the tumor formation we have to know that the special kind of cell can be formed so these special kind of the cell can be analyzed and we will be know that what kind of cancer is that or what kind of tumor is that and how long it have been in the body and how we going to treat them so this can be the primitive analysis of a tumor cell we are going to need of flow cytometry these measurements have shown relevance for diagnosis prognosis and treatment of patient with cancer so in this way any cancer patient can be treated by knowing the reason of their disease the measurement of cellular dna content by flow cytometry use fluorescent dye such as rubidium iodide that indicate into the dna helical structure so as we know that the fluorescence are going to give colors in the image so that's why we are having to use rubidium uh, iodide for interacting in the dna helical structure the fluorescence signal is directly proportional to the amount of dna in the nucleus and can identify gross green or loss in the dna so basically quantify of the dna can be done by here abnormal dna content also known as dna content aneuploidy can be determined in a tumor or cell population so when we are going to analyze the tumor cells also we are going to see the what kind of dna is present in their abnormal or normal or if they are tumor cell there is a 100% surety of getting a abnormal dna which basically uh, changes whole, whole the conformation of that particular cell cell cycle analysis the technique is based on the premises that the cell is in the growth to the growth one phase in the cycle cycle process as normal diploid chromosomal and hence dna content diploid whereas cell in the growth two and just prior to mitosis contain exactly twice the amount like the four chromosomes number so this is not four no, four times of the chromosomes number 
like the diploid phase is just over 2n. 3n is a triploid phase, 4n is a tetraploid phase. So this tetraploid phase, this is not normal inside a body. So that's why what kind of phasing problem inside a cell by the DNA content, by the chromosomes number, by the diploid, triploid, tetraploid, polyploidy, what kind of polyploidy situation can be seen in the cell that can be identified by the flow cytometry. In ecology also, like uh, as we studied that how this thing is going to help us in the case of the clinical emergency. So seeing the flow cytometry will going to work or help us to understand the ecology. In ecology, we are just not talking about the humans. There are environmental things, there are plants, there are little microorganisms, there are aquatic plants, there are terrestrial plants, there are xerophytes, there are hydrophytes. There are many things which uh, compromise or you can say which have the combinedly called the ecological system. So everything, every living thing can be analyzed by this flow cytometry. So any kind of disturbance in the environment can also analyze like what was the cause of that disturbance can be done by the flow cytometry. Flow cytometry and cancer research. Like just we really talk about in the tumor, the same phenomena work in here. Like the DNA content analysis and facts, they both relatively can apply in the cancer research. Because in the cancer, a cell behaving differently and their degree of uh, behavior, their degree of uh, like what changes have been occurred in that particular cell, that can be only classified in uh, difference or by the flow cytometry. So that's why we use the flow cytometry in the cancer research for analyzing a specific state of any cell present in a suspension or present in a organ or body. So this uh, flow cytometry or cancer research, if we uh, see it in a little detail, what else we can see here? Like uh, I'm just reading out some major particle things which have been very useful in the cancer research. Like the progenesis of the patient with cancer is largely determined by the specific histological diagnosis. Okay, any histological problem can be diagnosed. Tumor mass stage, what stage of the tumor cells has been performed. Post-performance state, like in which the organ, the, you can say the human body, if the tumor is in the human body or any other organism. So how they are uh, tolerating that state. So what is their performance status that can be analyzed. Quantitative cytology is a form of flow cytometry has greatly advanced the objective elidation of tumor cell heterogeneity by using probes and discriminate tumor and normal cell excess differentiate as well as the profilated tumor cell property. So on the basis of the fluorescence or you can say the fluorescence absorption, we are going to be difference out between the normal cell and the cancer cell. So you can see these cancer cell and normal cell, they cannot be bind to the same fluorophore which are going to use in the dye formation or sample preparation. So when we do the sample preparation in the flow cytometry, we will be very specific of the dyes and stain which we are going to use. Because every dye and every stain which we are going to use, they have a different complementation angle inside the cell. So different uh, complementation angle are responsible for localizing or identifying several molecules inside the cell. Both DNA content analysis and facts can be utilized in cancer research. Abnormal nuclear DNA content is a conclusive marker of malignancy and is found with increasing frequency in leukemia, like 33% among 793 patients. So when we do this uh, practical, practical version, we test them, the patients. So what we find, we find this Malignancy, or you can see the abnormal DNA content or increasing frequency of leukemia, like 23% of the patient. In lymphoma, 53% of the patient. In myeloma, that is 76% among the 177 patients. As well as in solid tumor, 75% among 3611 patients. 
and for an overall incident is a 67 percent in 4941 patients so you can see that a very huge research has been done for identifying the special abnormality of the cell and we found that in this rate is this is a healthy rate of finding anything in the research so that's why by having these all evidence we can know that we can rely on the flow cytometry for their results. They are going to give us the best result. So in overall discussion of the flow cytometry, I just like to say that if you wanted to analyze any kind of the cell structure, their function, their complexity, not uh, exactly the function, the complexity, or you can say the component analysis of the cell, like what are the cellular organs are present inside the cell and especially the shape of the cells. So by knowing the shape, by knowing the size, by knowing the component analysis, you can easily analyze or difference out any kind of the cell inside the suspension. So that's why this flow cytometry is used in many eras, or you can say that many application fields have been using flow cytometry for analyzing at the cell level. So this is all about this flow cytometry. These are some very important references you can go through and see if you wanted to study more about the flow cytometry. So you can go through these. There are several different aspects of knowledge has been given in these references. But still you have any confusion and you wanted to ask anything, you can message me and ask me if any uh, problem you face while studying the flow cytometry. Thank you.